All right, hello once again. This is Jeff Scott of Rankin Technical College, and we've been going over our textbook, JavaScript 6th Edition, the Web Warrior series, by Vodnik and Gosselin. And I just wanted to mention to you, we've gone through Chapter 1, which was our intro to JavaScript, Chapter 2, where we talked about functions, data types, and operators, Chapter 3, where we discussed arrays, um, loops, the if statement, and switch. Chapter 4, where we went over debugging and error handling. Chapter 5, which was all about the document object model. Chapter 6, which was on, we just finished, which was on enhancing and validating forms. So now I'm going to go into Chapter 7. And chapter 7 is one of the chapters, although I'm going to go over the PowerPoints, I'm not, uh, we're not going over that in class. There's just not enough time. So we will go through Chapter 7 fairly quickly. Then Chapter 8, which we will go through in class, I'll go through in more depth and breadth of coverage on strings and arrays. Chapter 9, I'll get a lecture on it, but we're not going to go over it in class, State Information and Security. Chapter 10, we may go over it because it's got some stuff in there. It's also not a real long chapter on mobile devices. Chapter 11, again, I'd like to go over it, but I don't think there'll be time and chapter 12, this one we will go over, and I'm going to spend a lot of time on this. Again, it's not a long chapter, which is good, so we can just have our own examples. So, again, I'm going to jump into chapter 7 right now is what I'm getting to. Okay? Oops. Really? There we go. All right, so chapter 7. <clears throat> is on object-oriented JavaScript. Notice we only have three objectives. Explain the basic concepts related to object-oriented programming. Use the date class, the number class, and the math class. And finally, define our own JavaScript objects. Object-oriented object programming is what's known as a paradigm shift. P-A-R-A-D-I-G-M shift. It means it's a shift in a, in, in a way of thinking. Okay? Um, one of the things that makes it so tempting for managers to look at and say, I want to use this, is it allows code reuse. All right? And anytime they see reuse, they think saving money. Object-oriented programming is about creating reusable software objects. So, for instance, let's let's pretend that I create an object. So let, let's let's assume that Enterprise Rent a Car contacts me and says, "We want you to, to we want to totally redo our our system for people taking out cars, and we want you to do it." So I create a reservation system for them, and I get it done. It's up. It's operational. It's working really well. Now. Holiday Inn contacts me and says, you know, we've got a lot of similarities. We do registrations, too, and they're pretty similar. If I write my code in a, in a good enough way, I can probably reuse most, if not almost all of it, from the reservation system for a car company that I can use for a reservation for a hotel. An object is when you take the code and the data and they're, they're kind of melded together and they're treated as one unit. Data are our variables, all right? Objects can be simple, and they can be very complex. <clears throat> Some of the better-known object-oriented programming languages are shown right here, and there are other ones, too. Now, I mentioned this earlier, but I'm going to say it again, and that is JavaScript is not an object-oriented programming language. What it is is it's an object-based programming language. What object-based means is Java has full, not, not full, but it has most object-oriented programming capabilities. But you are not forced, so to speak, to use them. So you don't have to necessarily use them. All right. In these other languages that you see mentioned here, all right, C++, Java, not JavaScript again, but Java, and Visual Basic, since those are object-oriented programming languages, virtually anything that you do 
in those languages will involve the use of objects and objects which are created from classes. All right. Now, what they're saying here is programs become a combination of objects you create and objects created by other programmers. Okay, that's all fine. So, before we even get into this, I'm going to take a little step back and talk to you about some of the hallmarks of some of the things that make up object-oriented programming. And the first thing that makes up object-oriented programming is what's called a class. In a class, is a blueprint for objects. And what's an object? It's kind of a lack, for lack of better words, a melding together of data and methods. Okay, well, what's data? That's basically our program variables and other variables. What's a method? A method is an action an object can perform. Now, I should mention the act of creating objects from classes is known as instancing the class or class instantiation. These are just terms that you're going to hear. and That's why I'm bringing them up. Now, I'm going to give you a non-computer example. Let's suppose that wherever you live right now, it doesn't matter where it is, but let's suppose that the neighborhood that you live in has got a street you know, you're, there's a street that's, you know, right at the end of your driveway, which typically happens anyway, right? But on the other side of the street is, is a 100-acre vacant lot. So one day a developer comes through there and buys that 100-acre acre vacant lot and says that what they're going to do on there is they're going to put up 100 houses, each on an acre. All right? And those houses, they're going to have five different house plans. We'll just call them, for lack of better words, plan one, plan two, plan three, plan four, and plan five. Some might be one story, some might be two story, doesn't matter. All right? But they're going to set them up so that, you know, they're, they're, there's 20 rows of houses. And row one will be plan one, two, three, four, five. Then row two will be your house, one, two, three, four, five, et cetera. We're going to keep doing that. Those five house plans that are used to build the houses would be, each one of them would be a separate house class. Each house that was built from that would be a house object. Now, as far as the data, well, all houses have, you know, so every house object, let's say that was made from class house one, let's say that it's a three bedroom ranch. So what would the data be? The data would be the number of bedrooms, which would be three. All right. Um, might be the number of bathrooms, which was two, as an example. But there's still things that could be different between each house. Just like if you look at an assembly line that makes an automobile. So let's say that you go to a Toyota plant. And they make Toyota Celicas. And they make a thousand a day, let's just say. Okay? Everyone that rolls off, let's assume they all are the same body style. So everyone that rolls off looks similar, but some might be red, some might be blue, some might be green, some might be gray, some might be white, some might have leather seats, some might have cloth seats, some might, you know, etc. Some might have two doors, some might have four doors. So what I'm showing, I'm going to tell you is, they're all made from the same class, but each object is unique. Think of human beings. Think of the class called human. Each one of us are a human object. What's our data? We all have a height. We all have a weight. We all have an eye color. We all have a gender. You know, examples like that. 
What are our methods or our actions? We all drink, we all sleep, we all eat. All right, so kind of keep that in mind. So that's the first thing. Second, talk about encapsulation, which will also get us into the idea of data hiding or information hiding. Let's see what the author says about this. Encapsulated objects. Code and data are contained within the object Excel itself. Encapsulation places code inside of a black box. Well, as an example, maybe not a good one, but as an example. Right now, if I do file, print, all right, I'm not physically hooked up to the printer, this, the T203 printer, but let's say that I was, and I click the print button. Well, what's going to happen is you'd hear noise in the background is the T203 printer would start to print this. Okay, it's 53 pages long, which is one reason I don't want to do that, but you get the idea. All right. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is I have absolutely no idea, physically or otherwise, what happens between the time I click the print button and the job starts to actually print. I don't know what happens, and I don't need to know because that information has been encapsulated from me. All right. For years, you know, people never built their own computers. You know, they just bought them from stores and you couldn't really open up the back of it because that would void the warranty. So what happened, you know, computers were known as a black box. That's where this started. You know, a lot of the stuff happens, but it's all under the hood. That also gets you to talking about interface. All right, so let me jump back into here. And before we even talk about, okay, so I just mentioned encapsulation, okay? We'll call it black box mentality. All right, but then I want to talk about interface versus implementation. All right, the interface is what an end user sees. And the implementation is what happens we'll say behind the scenes. And I can give you a real simple example right here. And that is, let's take a look at this. All right, here's a calculator. Here's a Windows calculator. This is the interface. This is what you see on the calculator. All right, but if I come in there and I type in 9,867 and I hit the square root button, I have absolutely no idea what happened internally inside of that calculator to make the system tell me that 99.33277404764256425 is the square root of 9367. I don't care what ha why, how it happened. I just care that it happened and that ideally at least it's correct. So the interface is, again, what, I, what, what the end user sees and, we'll just say for lack of better words, and it might not be the best verbiage, but it's the verbiage that I'm going to use. So it's what they see and what they, here's a surprise with the name of the word there, what they interface with. All right, so what do they direct, have direct contact with? The implementation is what happens behind the scenes. The reason that that's important is you don't let the end user see the implementation. Not only that, if somebody comes up with a brand new way of figuring out square roots, it's probably not gonna happen, but let's say someone did. So they came up with a new way of doing square roots and that new way was a lot faster than the old way. As long as I could still come in here, so they put the new way of doing that into the calculator, okay? As long as I can come in there and type in my 93, whoops, 67, and hit square root, and I get that answer. I think that was the answer, the one I put in originally. If it wasn't, I'm sorry. But I don't care. I don't care that they changed the implementation as long as the interface didn't change. All right, so you kind of keep that in mind. So when you hide things like that, it reduces complexity. 
it prevents accidental bugs it prevents people from stealing your code oh they use the calculator here too all right okay they mentioned that for example when you work with HTML the document object is encapsulated but you can use the get element by ID method which is part of the JavaScript interface that's used to communicate with it good example so I, these are the author's things. I, I gave them to you earlier, but the author defines a class as a grouping of code, methods, attributes, etc., making up an object. An instance is an object created from a class. To instantiate is to create the object. An instance of, a, of an object inherits all the methods and all the properties or data from the class. The object in the browser object model, or the BOM, is part of the web browser. You don't have to instantiate those. You get them automatically. Now, these are built-in JavaScript classes, so this is stuff that you have available for you, to you, without you having to do anything special. You can just use it. Kind of nice. Instantiating an object. Some of the built-in JavaScript objects can be used directly in code. For instance, you can use the math object without even having to create a math. You can use the math class, I should say, without having to create a math object. It's just the name of the class, math.py. Okay, kind of nice. You can create, you can instantiate an array object in different ways. We looked at that already. We already had the chapter on arrays. You can create generic objects. This would be something that we're going to get to in this chapter, but this is how you'd create. Notice it's bracket, bracket here, and it's curly brace, curly brace here. That means that accounts payable is an object. You can create date objects, all right, that hold the date. Garbage collection is basically cleaning up or reclaiming memory reserved by the program. You don't have to worry about it typically because JavaScript does garbage collection for you. When you declare a variable or when you instantiate an object, you reserve memory for the variable or for the object. When JavaScript no longer needs that variable or object, it will garbage collect and automatically clean up the, the, the uh, memory. All right, three of the most commonly used JavaScript classes. I want to see if I still have this. I I'm, I'm, don't like doing this, but I, I'm going to go off on a little bit of a tangent. Again, don't worry about any of this stuff, but I wanted to look at something that is in, whoops, that is in here. All right, and I'm going to go way down toward the bottom to find it. So if it is here, I know, I know where it will be. There, we got it. Oh, thank you. One of my students from... 2017 2018 class Brady Williams was good enough I used to go out to this site called hunlock.com and they had really good JavaScript stuff on there if you go out there now you get this message which says cannot connect the database it's down it's been like that for the last year so Brady went out after class one day and looked and found all the stuff that's there archived now the presentation here is really ugly I'll admit that but JavaScript tutorial, JavaScript numbers, JavaScript arrays, strings, functions, JavaScript objects, dates, and Ajax for noobs. So again, what's nice about this is this site is just packed full of information and good information. I just I probably have a font size that's too big, but to me. All right, so I probably can make it 20. Well, there is the URL. I'm literally going to leave it up there for just a moment. All right. 
but as mentioned, let's see, did I? Nope, that is it. Yep. As mentioned, though, this is an archived site. I suppose it's possible that it could go away at any time. Okay, but let's say that I wanted to know more about arrays. We've already gone over arrays, but I just clicked the link there for JavaScript arrays. Okay, mastering arrays, there's an introduction, creating an array, initializing an array, different kinds of arrays, etc., etc., etc. These are all the different methods that you can use for arrays. This is just such a doggone nice site. It really and truly is. All right. So three of the most commonly used JavaScript classes are the date class to give you dates and you can get the time from it too, the number class, and the math class. So the date class, by default, when you, when you create a new date object, you get the current date and the current time. There's all sorts of ways and you can grab all sorts of pieces from it. So if you only wanted, so this gives you the current date and time. All right. And there's other things that you can do with a date object. Again, sorry to keep doing this, but if I go back to where I just showed you, and if I jump back here under this Hunlock site and I go to JavaScript dates, all right, dates, the complete reference, how to create dates, different types of dates, making date timers, Somewhere in here is going to be, you know, here's all the different methods. So if you want to pluck off pieces of the date or set pieces of the date, okay? And that's, again, if you want to, if you want to get means that you want to grab a piece of information that's in there. Set means that you want to change the information. Gets are called accessors. Sets are called mutators because they change things. All right. Here are some examples. So this would give you the date and the time. But if I say just get date, it'll just give you the date. I believe there's a get time also. So there's all sorts of things you can do with this. All right, I believe that since we're computers, I believe this is right, that Sunday is day zero. Saturday is day six. So the days of the week, instead of going from one to seven, they go from zero to six, which can be a little confusing. Same thing with months. The way this is set up now, January would be month zero, December would be month 11, which would probably be very confusing. There's ways around that. We'll talk about that in later classes. The number class is mentioned has methods for manipulating numbers and properties containing static values. They can represent the numeric limitations, so they can show what the largest number the computer can hold, the smallest number the computer can hold, for example. All right. Here are some examples of number methods. Which of these am I going to use, Jeff? Probably the ones that you're going to use are too fixed which you use that most often if you're working with dollars and cents or something that you want to a certain number of, number of decimal places, possibly to string, to convert a number to a string, and possibly value of, to go the other way, to go from a string to a number. So I already mentioned the two fix. The locale string is if you're working with other countries. So this would show you the biggest value the computer can hold, smallest, NAN we've already dealt with, not a number. The value of negative infinity, the value of positive infinity, which to me sounds kind of funny. The math class, remember you can use things from the math class without having to instantiate it. So in other words, we can just say math.square root. And if, and if we're doing the square root of current number, which is 144, it'll give us 12. So here are the major methods of the math class. Now. Which ones are you going to use? Well, absolute value, yes. All right, if I'm 60 years old and my daughter Taylor is 26, there's 34 years between us. And it doesn't matter whether I say 60 minus 26 or 26 minus 60, because ne a negative doesn't make any sense there. That's where you'd use absolute value. The cosine, probably never use. 
The sine, probably never used. Tangent, arctangent, etc. probably not. The ceiling, yes. That's when you round up the next highest whole number. Cosine, no. Exponent, possibly. Floor is when you round down. So with ceiling, you round up. With floor, you round down. Log, again, probably not. Max and min, you might, but it's easier to write your own function that you can write and make it easier. The power function is raising something to a power. So if I said pow, 4, comma 2, that would be like 4 squared or 16. The rand you might use quite a bit to generate a random number. The round you might use quite a bit to round to a certain number of decimal places. Sine, probably not. Square root, very well could. Tangent, probably not. All right, so here's some of the different things that you can work with. Again, I'm not going to read any of these to you. The one in there you might use the most often, I would guess, would be pi. Here are some examples. Okay. Again, I mentioned this to you before on this slide here. JavaScript, not a true object-oriented programming language. All right? Because you don't have to use the capabilities. Also, you don't directly create classes in JavaScript. So rather than being an object-oriented programming language, it's called an object-based programming language. You can define your own objects. All right. By either saying, so if I wanted to create a new object called person, I could say var person equal new object, or I could say var person equal with a set of curly braces. I think you can put a blank space in there. I don't think that matters. After you've created an object, you can assign properties to it. So if I've created an object called inventory list, I can assign a property called inventory date to it in the way that's shown right there. All right, I think this is a good place to leave off. I'm going to stop right here and I'm going to continue this in just a little bit.